Okay, so we're gonna get started. Good morning, everybody. Okay, you can do a lot better, a lot better. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. First of all, I wanna thank all of you for coming. I know it is the week before Thanksgiving and you all have a lot to do. I have some veggies to chop up today, so, so I know your time is valuable and I'm glad you're here, so thank you. My name is Samantha Abramson. I'm the Executive Director at the Nathan and Esther Peltz Holocaust Education Resource Center, which is a program of the Milwaukee Jewish Federation. I'm joined here today by our amazing board members and staff. If you are a HERC board member or staff member, I hope you'll uh, either stand up or raise your hand. These are wonderful people. And if you have any questions about what our organization does in the state to bring Holocaust education into classrooms, into communities, and into families, uh, please feel free to reach out to any of them. They are the experts. Many years ago, as a teenager, I had the opportunity to visit the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. How many of you have been there, just by show of hands? Okay, a lot of people. I'm noticing more in the back than the front, which is an interesting study here. Okay. So when I went for the first time, I was actually like most of you here up front. I was a student. Uh, I was 15 years old, and I had just won the Milwaukee Community's Holocaust Art Essay Contest. So my prize was going to the museum to learn more about the Holocaust. And I didn't realize that this was actually gonna be the first and many experiences, experiences that I would have uh, in my career related to that museum. During this first trip, I encountered a huge three-story room. Uh, many of you, if you've been there, have probably seen it. This huge three-story room that is just filled to the brim with photographs. Uh, thousands and thousands of black and white photographs uh, depicting everyday life. You see bar mitzvahs, you see weddings, you see families just at the beach or are having a picnic. And this was a very jarring and surprisingly emotional experience for me. Because what I didn't realize at the time was that what I was seeing were the faces of an entire shtetl, an entire village uh, of, within the Jewish community uh, in a part of Europe that no longer exists. Almost everybody in those photographs that I saw uh, were later killed by the Nazis and their collaborators. And this, this lens, this, this moment captured life, the lives that they lived, the lives that were cut short because of the Holocaust. These images felt very different from everything else I saw at the museum that day because most Holocaust images that we think about as historians, as scholars, are, and the ones you've probably seen on TV, including the, the recent Ken Burns documentary, they're, they're black and white. They are usually taken actually by the perpetrators who committed the genocide. They're taken by the Nazis uh, to document what they did, to dehumanize their victims. And these photographs were very different because we look at their faces, we see their joy, we see their celebration, and we see their lives well lived. While critical for documenting the Holocaust, these photographs taken by perpetrators are not enough to tell the story. We need those stories of the lives before the Holocaust. Yaffa Eliach was a Holocaust survivor who became a world-renowned historian. She not only understood the power of photography, but knew the importance of conserving them for future generations. She dedicated her life to saving photographs that documented her Jewish community before the Holocaust in Eishashuk, the shtetl where she lived. How do you tell a story through photographs? Right now, while we're all just uh, sitting in this room, I want you to think about a photograph any photograph that you've ever taken or that you own that means something to you. Maybe it's something you just took on your cell phone the other day. Maybe it's a photograph you keep on your nightstand at night. Maybe it's a photograph you have on Instagram. Whatever it is, think about that photograph. Who's in it? Who took it? And why is it so meaningful to you? And think about that photograph as we're going through the program today. Let me tell you about what we're gonna do over the next hour or so. First, we are excited to have famed uh, children's author Hannah Stiefel with us today. Her new book, The Tower of Life, was inspired by Yaffa Eliach's story. 
And for those students in the room, you've received free copies already. Uh, Hannah will be able to sign those uh, afterwards if you'd like. And you'll be able to follow along with the, those books as we're, as we're uh, doing the program today. Anybody else who would like a copy of this book, and, and really everybody should, it's fantastic, you can see Jenny over here from Boswell Books, who is going to be uh, available to sell you a copy after the program. And again, Hannah will be available to sign those books as well. We'll learn from Hannah this morning, we'll read her book together, we will answer questions that the book uh, prompts, and then part two of the morning, we are going to be focusing on photography itself. Uh, thinking about how we can use photos to tell the stories of individuals, communities, and families. We're going to be joined by Pulitzer Prize winning photographer Gary Porter, uh, who will show us how we can be using photography to document stories. Before I get started, uh, I also want us to thank the Wisconsin Humanities uh, and the Rickheimer families for generously sponsoring today's community program. Donations like this allow HERC to do its amazing work and offer community programs and student engagements that teach us the Holocaust, about the Holocaust and bring our communities together. If you would like to learn more about HERC, think about sponsoring a future program, or think, learn more about anything we do, again, please speak to those board members and staff present today. I also want to thank our promotional partners uh, who are with us today, uh, Congregation Emmanuel, uh, Congregation Sinai, Congregation Shalom, uh, Milwaukee Community Hebrew School, Boswell Books, the Harry and Rose Sampson JCC, uh, Friendship Circle, and if I missed anybody else, let me know. But I want to just say what an amazing grouping of our community coming together under one roof. All right, with that, I'm done. I'm going to hand it over to Hannah. Morning. So amazing to see you all today. So much hard work went into the planning of this event, and I'm so honored to be here. First, I want to thank my parents and my family and friends who are back home in New Jersey and in Israel who are not here today, but I'm sure will catch the replay. And thank you to Herc, to Samantha Abramson, Sam Goldberg, Michael Morris, Brian Ed Edwardson, Sarah Sillers, and all of the, for all the amazing dedication that went into planning this event. I've met some of the board of directors today. It's an honor to meet you. Um, I want to thank the Wisconsin Humanities, the sponsors of these event, this event, and Boswell Books for being here. A special thank you to my dear friend Lisa Weimer, a force of nature, <laughs> an award-winning author of the YA novel The Assignment and Hork board member, who sparked this idea to invite me to your community. Also to author Debbie, Debbie Lackritz, who's here, <laughs> um, with her mother and her husband Jay. Um, they hosted me this weekend, and they prepared, prepared delicious food in her warm and wonderful community. Um, Debbie's new book, picture book, A Place to Belong, Debbie Friedman Sings Her Way Home, comes out December 6th, right after Thanksgiving, and she's having a launch party over at Boswell Books, so please check it out. It's a beautiful book about Jewish joy. And I want to thank you to my co-presenter, award-winning photographer Gary Porter for being here, and also to all of you for coming out on this cold morning and giving me such a warm welcome. So I've been sharing my book on Zoom with teachers and writers. This is my first time reading it in person, and my first book reading to children. So welcome to all of you, the Hebrew School students who are here today. I wrote this book for you. Okay, speaking of children, one of these is me, <laughs> okay? Um, I live in New Jersey now, but I grew up in the warm community of North Miami Beach, Florida. This was my entire class. So it was a small community, and my parents were um, founders of the community and very involved, and they started this new school. It was called Torah Academy. There was a class of boys, but we almost never saw them. I don't know if you guys can guess which one is me. Anybody want to take a guess from the kids? Go ahead. <laughs> With the vest? Yes, that's me. I love that the vest was attached to the dress. That was cool back then. Um, and um, the people in the back there are very key. Um, the woman with the beret was my principal, Shalameth Gittleson. And the woman with the long hair, she was my English teacher. And because it was a small school, um, I had her for three years. And she was the one who encouraged me to become a writer. Her name was Carol Singer, and she was remarkable. Um, um, remarkable things happen when you're working on a book. 
My mother had sent me a box of materials from my childhood, including all my old report cards, unfortunately. And, um, and in that box, while I was researching Yaffa's story, I found my poetry book. My maiden name was Fryman, so Hannah Fryman. And in there, I found a poem called Holocaust Day. So I'm not going to read the entire thing. I wasn't a good rhymer then. I'm not a good rhymer now. <laughs> um, but I'm going to read you the second stanza. Yells and cries were heard from afar. No one paid attention to the war. People were slaughtered, it said on the news, because they were different. They were Jews. So I clearly had learned about the Holocaust as a child. I knew Holocaust survivors. My parents had friends who were survivors. It was definitely something on my mind. But I never considered writing a book about a Holocaust survivor or a Holocaust story. I've written about 30 books for children. These are some of them. I've written about creepy animals for National Geographic. I wrote a funny story about a girl who returns her dad to the daddy store, Daddy Depot. About a girl who has a hard to pronounce name because my name, Hana, is always mispronounced. Chena, China, Kahana. Um, so it's called, my name is Waka Waka Lach. Um, I wrote a book about the Statue of Liberty. Um, I was telling Gary earlier, it's a story about um, how when the Statue of Liberty uh, came to America on 350 pieces. America didn't want to pay for the pedestal. It would have cost $100,000. So school children sent in their pennies. Um, and you can find out more about that story later. But as you can see, oh, and this is my newest book. Um, both of my books came out last month. My first two Jewish books came out last month. This one's called Mendel's Hanukkah Mess Up by me and my co-author husband, Larry Stiefel. He's in New York today at the Chabad uh, Kinos in Crown Heights <laughs> with our publisher. It's a lovely story about a guy who always messes up and his rabbi believes in him and gives him the opportunity to drive the mitzvah mobile with the big menorah on the roof around town. What could possibly go wrong? In any case, you can see I write about nature and history and funny stories. And then something happened. In 2016, I opened up my New York Times and I saw the obituary of this remarkable woman, Yaffa Eliyah. And I was struck by her hope and resilience after having suffered the tragedy of, of the Holocaust. Um, she was asked by Jimmy Carter, having survived the Holocaust, I'll tell you, you'll see in the book more about her story, but as Samantha said, she wanted to focus on lives that were lived, on dignity, not disaster, and not on death because she remembered her beautiful town. And she collected photographs. And if you could picture a tower like three stories high, this room and two more above it, filled with photographs of her town, she wanted to focus on light and love and laughter. Her mission was to document the Holocaust victims' lives, not just their deaths, to give them back their humanity. And this really stayed with me. And I knew I had to write a picture book, a book for children about Yaffa el Yaf, so that the next generation would know. I know that Holocaust, it's 80 years since the Shoah, and Holocaust survivors are passing away, and it is up to us to share their stories, to bear witness. And I wasn't sure how I was going to do it, but I knew I was going to try. Um, and when you ever, whenever you meet an author, and you, like, and you read their book, always ask them, why did you write their story? So why did I write this book? This is my family tree. By raising your hand, how many of you know where your parents were born? Excellent. How many of you know where your grandparents were born? Okay. How about great-grandparents? Okay. <laughs> so we're all getting together, hopefully, for Thanksgiving. It's a good time to talk to your family about your family heritage. Um, this is the family tree of my great-grandfather, Shalom Hershkovitz, who came to America in the 1920s. But he left behind his parents and 10 siblings. During the war, Shalom lost eight of his 10 siblings and their wives and their children and his parents. Two of his siblings survived Auschwitz along with two nieces. But every name that you see highlighted there, Hensha, Yocheved, Leah, Rivka, Yosef, Gitzel, Leah, Yo just the names go on and on, that was one family. Our branches were cut off and that was the end of them. But my grandfather survived. He had seven children. He moved to Chicago. Some of you might have been there. Um, my grandmother and my mother were born there. And um, there were over 300 descendants from my grandfather, give or take more being born every day. So um, 
This is one reason I wanted to honor their memory. These are my in-laws. So the girl in the white dress with the red stripes, her name was Hannah Laura. Hannah Laura uh, Guthoff Stiefel. Uh, she grew up in a town called Schwäbisch Hall in Germany. Her family had been there for hundreds of years. She witnessed Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass in Germany. Her father was taken to Dachau. And her, when he was able to get out because he had an American visa, but they knew it wasn't safe for, for Hannah to stay in Germany. So when she was six years old, picture a six-year-old, they put her on a train by herself with a plaque around her neck, and she was, staying, she was sent to a family that they knew in Belgium. Fortunately, a year later, her parents were able to get out of Germany. They met her in London, and they sailed for America. And that's a picture of my mother-in-law, Hannah, standing with her classmates in front of the Statue of Liberty from the Journal American from 1943. And I happen to have written a book about the Statue of Liberty, so that, that photograph means a lot to us. Over here is my father-in-law, Arnold Stiefel. So he came to America from a town called Flacht in Germany. He fled Germany in the 1930s because of anti-Semitism. And his education ended when he was 14 because he had to go to work in a supermarket where he learned English. When the war started, he went back to Germany as an American soldier in Patton's Third Army and witnessed the liberation of Mauthausen. I was in Yad Vashem in February, um, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. If you go to the end of the exhibit, there is a film of the liberation of Mauthausen. And I captured this picture of my father-in-law at the liberation. So that's him. And both of my in-laws have passed away, so I'm honoring their memory by sharing this story with you. I did a lot of research for this book. Um, first, I read Yaffa's book. It's called There Once Was a World, a 900-year chronicle of the shtetl of Aisha Shock. Her family roots went back 900 years. It's a big book, <laughs> about 800 pages. But if you can, find a copy and read through it. You can see all my Post-it notes. Um, I also got permission from Yaffa's family to tell her story. Um, I can tell a little bit more about this later, but fortunately I was able to meet her daughter, Smadar Rosenzweig, who's a professor of Bible at Stern College, and she gave me permission to write this story, and she helped me fill in some of the facts. I also watched documentaries about Aisha Shock, and I did a lot of other research with um, articles and so on. Um, in the book, Yaffa writes, I hope that the portrait I have drawn will bring back to life many of the shtetl's adorable traditions, that it will offer knowledge of the past and hope for the future, that it will build bridges between the world that once was and the world that is to be, and that the world of the future will be a better one because of those bridges. And when you walk through the Tower of Life, you are walking through a bridge from the past to the present to the future. I also went through a lot of photo archives. So Yaffa's collection is at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum online. You can go today and click through it. It's remarkable. There are thousands of pictures that she collected. Um, and you'll learn more about them from the book. Um, they're also at Yad Vashem and at the Jewish Heritage Museum of New York. So when you look at these pictures, what Yaffa wanted, she wanted everyone who saw her exhibit or read her book, or see the, everyone to see these pictures, to see themselves in the photographs. So what does that mean? To connect, right? To look at the images of these people of Aisha Shock and feel a connection. So for example, you see here this boy on skis. I'm sure some of you here have seen snow. So <laughs> maybe you'll connect to that boy on skis. Are these girls who do ballet or this musician? And they, you might see them appear in the book. Also, today when we take pictures, we tend to snap them on our phones, but a photograph is light and life captured in time. Photographs were printed, on, they were taken on film and printed. So it's light and life captured in time. And when you look at this, these photographs, Yaffa would have wanted you to think of what happened before these photographs, the past, the present, what's going on in each photograph, and what happened to these people afterward. So I'm just gonna show you a few more. Um, Yaffa's grandmother ran a photo studio. There's a little ad for the photo studio there on your left. And this is her grandmother in the black jacket. These were strong women. I always pictured, this, they, this is a race stereotypes for me. I pictured women of the shtetl at home with their children and cooking. But these were entrepreneurial women who ran businesses. And you could see why Yaffa might have grown up to be a strong woman. Um, that is not Yaffa, but her, her brother Yitzhak is one of the boys on the bottom. There are pictures of Yaffa as a young girl. 
Um, her grandmother took pictures for people's Rosh Hashanah cards. How many of you guys send out New Year's greetings each year, either by email or text or, or actual cards? Um, these were Rosh Hashanah cards that people sent around the world, and they were taken in that photo studio. This was the milkman of Aisha Shock. Um, he was very beloved, and the Afa tells the story that when he went to synagogue on Saturdays, the farmers, the Christian and Muslim farmers, would take off their hats in his honor when he walked by. His children moved to America, and he went to visit them, but he came back to Aisha Shock. He said he preferred people who walk on the street than people who walk on the walls. So what does that mean? He had seen a movie, a motion picture, for the first time, and he saw people walking on the walls, and he said he preferred people walking on the street. So he came back to Aisha Shock, and tragically, he met his fate. This is Yaffa as a little girl feeding the chickens. And this is me. I went to visit the Holocaust Museum in 2018. I was on crutches because I had torn my Achilles and my husband wheeled me around, so it is handicap accessible. Um, it's a remarkable thing to see. If you can go there, it's really very special. Um, I know that they're doing some repairs, so between January and March of this year, my, they'll have some scaffolding up, but it's definitely worthwhile. Um, it's a feeling of awe, and it really takes your breath away. And this is my son, Josh. He was 12 at the time. And I show this picture to show you how important it is to share um, our legacy and, and Jewish history and the history of the Holocaust with children. So thank you guys for being here. And this is my story, The Tower of Life. It was illustrated by an amazing illustrator named Susan Gall. I had the great opportunity to meet her um, two weeks ago in New York City. There was a gallery opening of the Society of Illustrators, and one of her pieces from the book, which I'll show you, is in that gallery. Um, it was published by Scholastic. And when I show you this book, I would love for you to think of your Milwaukee community. And if you find connections between your community and with Aisha Shock. That's what Yaffa would have wanted. And think about Jewish values or your own values, wherever you come from, um, and see how they play out in this story. Okay, the Tower of Life, how Yaffa el rebuilt her town in stories and photographs. Okay, I'm going to read from my book. Hold on. Do you want to click through? There once was a girl named Yaffa. She was a spirited girl who loved her home and her family. She was born in a shtetl, a small Jewish town that pulsed with love, laughter, and light. The name of her shtetl was Aisha Shock. One sec. So when I, I'm going to pause on a few pages. When we go from those black and white photos to this, to this spread here, the first thing you notice, the color. It was a vibrant. It was filled with life. And I feel like this is like a sensory experience because you can almost smell the grass and the trees. You can hear the people calling out to each other, right? The sounds of the town. And you could just feel life when you first see Aisha Shock. The family roots of the, the, family roots of the people in Aisha Shock ran deep. For 900 years, their histories and spirits were woven into the fabric of the town. On holidays, Yaffa's family and their neighbors walked down Eternity Lane to the old cemetery where grandparents told tales of their ancestors buried beneath their feet. Their stories swirled around one another, keeping their faith and traditions alive. And I love this spread because this to me says, Misora, it's about telling your family stories and instilling them in your children. As the seasons turned, Yaffa, her older brother Yitzchak, and their many cousins played in the town. In winter, they went sledding and skating. In summer, they swam in the lake and chased one another through the forest. On market days, Yaffa helped her grandma Chaya sell candles. They laughed as they shouted over the other merchants hawking their wares. An organ grinder and his pet monkey entertained Yaffa and her friends, handing them fortunes for a fee. Most of all, Yaffa loved to help out in her Grandma Alta's photography studio, just above the family's pharmacy. Many years earlier, Yaffa's grandfather had returned from a visit to America with a brand new invention, a camera. Since then, Grandma Alta had become one of the town's photographers. She captured the shopkeepers, newlyweds, babies, and bar mitzvah boys on film. It seemed everyone in town wanted Grandma Alta to take their picture. 
And on the eve of each Jewish New Year, people from all over Aisha Shock would mail their treasured photographs to their families around the world with greetings for good health and happiness. When Yaffa was six years old, Grandma Alta captured a treasured moment of Yaffa making funny faces as she fed the chickens. It seemed the happy times would never end, but that same summer, darkness came to Aisha Shock. German tanks and motorcycles rumbled over the ancient bridge, boots stomped, hate filled the air. Jewish schools and businesses were shut down, including Grandma Alta's photography studio. Nearly all of the Jews of Aisha Shock were rounded up. Men and women were packed like cattle inside the town synagogue. I just want to pause here for a second. Um, the illustrator said to me that everyone has faces in this book except for the Nazis. She felt that if they chose to try to erase the humanity of another people, their faces did not belong in a book. Sensing doom, Yatha's father escaped through one of the synagogue's windows and raced to his family. He convinced them to flee. They had no time to collect clothing or food, but Yaffa tucked a few family photographs into her shoes, special memories of the life they would leave behind, happiness frozen in time. In just two days, nearly all 3,500 of Aisha Shock's Jewish souls were erased with the hateful explosions of gunfire. Suddenly, a deathly silence. In a heartbeat, 900 years of history uprooted. Miraculously, Yaffa, her parents, and her brother Yitzchak escaped to the forest. A kind farmer hid them in his underground shelter. They were cold, hungry, filthy, and frightened. Yaffa held on to her family photographs for dear life. Over many months, Yaffa's mother taught her to read and write by scraping letters into the damp clay walls of the shelter. Her father kept their spirits alive by sharing stories of the town's holidays and weddings. Yaffa's parents showed her how a glimmer of light can chase away the darkness. So on the wall, some of you might be able to read Hebrew. It says tikva, which is hope, or, which is light, shalom, peace, and Chaim, which is life. And that's my handwriting. They were able to scan in my handwriting onto the cave wall. Throughout the war, the family hid in pigsties and potato sheds. Wherever they ran, Yaffa held on to her precious photographs, sunshine and smiles and chickens. They reminded her of home, snapshots of light and life captured in time. When the war ended, Yaffa knew it wasn't safe to return to Aisha Shock. No Jews remained. As a refugee, she wandered across Europe through Egypt to Jerusalem. But Yaffa never let herself be swallowed by the dark past. Instead, she worked hard in school, grew up, fell in love, and married. Yaffa and her husband moved to America and raised a family. Having survived the Holocaust, Yaffa became a professor of history, a world-renowned scholar of that terrible time period. Every now and then, she looked at her family photographs to remind herself of the life that once was. Her beloved Aisha Shock still remained in her heart. 35 years after the war was over, President Jimmy Carter reached out to Yaffa. A new museum was being built in Washington, D.C., documenting the victims of the Holocaust. He asked Yaffa to help build a memorial, but Yaffa didn't want to reflect on death and darkness. Instead, she wanted to create something that would shine a light onto the beautiful lives of people lost and forgotten. But what could that be? Yaffa thought about Aisha Shock's brides and grooms, scholars and schoolchildren, milkmen and musicians. What happened to their families who left before the war? Where did they go? What memories did they hold? So here you can see the people of Aisha Shock are looking out at you, the readers, the audience, and they're saying, look at us, we are people. And you can see that musician that, from that photograph and the brides and the bar mitzvah boys, and you can see the milkman. Yaffa remembered the photograph she had tucked in her shoes as a child. That was it. Maybe others saved their photos too, the family albums they cherished and the pictures they received as New, Year gre New Year's greetings so long ago. Yaffa decided she would find the survivors and rebuild Aisha Shock, not brick by brick, but photograph by photograph, story by story. 
Yaffa set out on a sacred mission. She placed ads in newspapers, spoke on radio shows, and followed leads that took her around the globe. She found former residents and descendants of Aisha Shak who had stored photographs in attics and basements. In Israel, Yaffa knocked on 42 doors of an apartment building until she, until she found a former townsman. Together, they dug up a treasure trove of photos and letters he had buried in tinned cans under a palm tree. Whenever she met fellow Aishishkins, they hugged and laughed and cried. Many remembered Yaffa as a child or knew her family. They invited their family members to revive old stories. Yaffa felt like she was breathing new life into her beloved shtetl. But not everyone trusted Yaffa with their precious family photos. Yaffa asked to borrow albums to make copies. Sometimes she traded sneakers or color TVs in exchange for photographs. And what treasures they were. The photos showed heroes, not victims. Dignity, not disaster. Lives lived, not lost. Every photograph, a world in itself. In all, Yaffa's journey spans 17 years. She traveled to six continents, nearly all 50 U.S. states, and hundreds of cities, towns, and villages. She collected 6,000 photographs and stories that included almost every man, woman, and child of Aisha Shock's Jewish community from the past 100 years. And then when you have the book, you need to flip it over like this to show the tower. Today, if you travel to Washington, D.C., you can see Yaffa's Tower of Life in the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. More than a thousand photos of the people of Aisha Shock soar three stories high for all the world to see, a world filled with love, laughter, and light, a world that will never be forgotten. One photograph in the collection shows a curious little girl in a gingham dress held in her father's arms. The girl's name is Yaffa. She was born in a shtetl called Aisha Shock. May her spirit and legacy continue to shine forever. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I almost made it through without crying. <laughs> um, as I said, miraculous things happen when you work on a book. So when I told my own children that I was writing a book about Yaffa Elyah, my son said, oh, Liam Elia, her grandson, is my chemistry lab partner at Yeshiva University. <laughs> and my daughter, Abby, said, Noah Elia, her granddaughter, is my friend from camp, and we're in Stern College together. And this past summer, my daughter Abby, the blonde girl in the flower dress, and Noah, was at Noah Elia's wedding, Yaffa's granddaughter's wedding. So this photograph says to me, light and life, captured in time, Jewish continuity. What could be more beautiful than that? And actually, Yaffa and Noah got together yesterday for Shabbat lunch <laughs> yeah, in, in Noah's new home. And one more slide. Um, I have a free curriculum guide for any of the teachers or parents in the room who want to look at the story further. You can find it on my website. And I, and I did a presentation for teachers. Um, the Holocaust Museum, like your museum, is educating teachers. And they shared with me some interesting developments. The exhibit. Um, was created in 1990. A whole generation has gone by. And to reach the younger generation, and for those of us who have short attention spans, um, they added augmented reality to the exhibit. So now you can walk into the exhibit, pick up an iPad, hold it in front of one of the photographs. It will be colorized in front of your eyes. You will be able to listen, because of Yaffa, to the history of the person or people in the photographs. You learn about their life and what happened to them. And there's also audio that goes with that. So that's already happening right now. And they, as I said, they're refurbishing the exhibit, so they're, they're actually, um, photos take a lot of, go through a lot of wear and tear over time. So they're refurbishing them slowly over time, so they'll be scaffolding up. But you can still go to the exhibit now and see it for yourself. But thank you very much. <laughs> photos can help us tell these stories because every individual story matters. And that is why we are so excited to have Gary Porter with us who's going to walk us through some of the photos he's documented. Uh, I just want to say a quick word about Gary. 
Uh, you've probably seen his work, even if you don't recognize his name, which you should. Uh, he's been documenting Wisconsin uh, Wisconsin's communities for decades, and we are so, so grateful to have him in our community today. Thank you, Gary. Well, thanks for all, all of you for, for coming, and <clears throat> it's going to be a hard act to follow with Kana, but uh, I'll do my best. Um, <clears throat> I was a photographer with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel for 30 years, and for a smaller paper for 10 years before that. So I've always really enjoyed documenting communities and documenting people's lives and putting a human face on stories that other reporters would be writing. And I was lucky enough to be able to do that for the newspaper. They sent me all over the place. And um, <clears throat> the photos that I'm going to show are from a story that I did on a Hmong, <clears throat> a, a Hmong refugee camp in Thailand that was being disbanded. And about 5,000 of them were going to be coming to Wisconsin to live with families that were already here, mostly your church churches and things like that <clears throat> were helping them out. So <clears throat> it are, it's a story not of a Holocaust, but it is a story of persecution and in some ways. They, they were uh, driven out of China where their original home was and <clears throat> went through migration through Burma and, and Cambodia, Laos, and they fought for the United States during the Vietnam War, in the secret war, it was called in Laos and Cambodia. And they were promised by the US government that they would be able to resettle in America, which really didn't happen for very many of them. And a lot of them spent time in a refugee camp and lived their whole lives up until they, were, they disbanded the camp in Thailand and uh, came to the United States. So basically, I wanted to talk a little bit about photo documentary, photo photography, and uh, photo essays, and photo stories. Because basically, this is a story of, there's 17 photographs all together, and each one should add something to the story, and it should help tell something and give some insight into the people that are in the photos and that, are, uh, <clears throat> that came to this, to this country. So this is a story a little bit of about, I went to the camp in Thailand and stayed there for about a week and documented them and then uh, followed some of the families back here to the United States where they settled in Milwaukee. And it was kind of the story of this transition and trying to contrast their life in the camp to their life in their new life in America. A lot of them had families here that had come back in the 70s and there were various migrations. So a lot of the, the families that they were coming to visit, to join were already acclimated to the United States and to this kind of life and a lot of them uh, spoke good English and and so it was a it was a really interesting uh, to see the lives of the people from the camp as they came and and they were living the old life sort of there and and then uh, come here and and have to change all over so <clears throat> um, let's see here What, so with the kids that are going to be doing the documentary of their communities using a camera and photographs, I just wanted you to think a little bit about what, that, what you're actually doing and what you're going to be photographing. Because you want each photograph to tell something important. You can tell it as a story or you can tell it as an essay, as whatever wherever you want, but, um, <clears throat> but you want each photograph to, to speak for itself. 
Okay, so this first photograph, I let off with a little baby who was sleeping in, in the camp in there. It was kind of a makeshift shelter and on this American flag <clears throat> pillow. So the baby is, is completely unaware of what's gonna happen in the next few days when they have to leave the camp and, and start a whole new life. So I kind of wanted to show that aspect and <clears throat> the American flag you know, shows what's gonna be happening to them. So each element should, each element in the photograph should contribute to the overall story of what you wanna tell. It's kind of a subtractive process for me where you eliminate things that you don't really want or that don't add to what you're trying to say. So. So this is just one of the youngest kids in the camp. And this is the oldest woman in the camp. She was rumored to be over 100 years old. Nobody really knew how old she was. But she was looking forward to <clears throat> coming to Milwaukee because her daughter already moved here several years ago. And so she wanted to come and see her daughter before she died. So you have the old and the young in two photographs, both one not knowing what they're doing and the other one well aware of it. Um, this is sort of a scene setter of the camp. I wanted to show what the life sort of looks like. Um, <clears throat> the rows, rolls of barbed wire. They couldn't freely go in and out of the camp a uh, few people could go out to work, but that was about it. So there were thousands of people in this camp, and they lived in little shelters that they threw together with um, whatever they could find, basically. <clears throat> okay, so... Sorry. These are some kids that are going to school. Most of the children weren't, uh, weren't able to go to school at all, but there was a small school that some of them did attend. And this, <clears throat> I guess I, by taking this photograph, I wanted to kind of show uh, how they're, they're young and, and their lives are gonna change so much and eventually you'll see another photograph from when they're in Milwaukee and it's the, for their first day of school so the two photographs work together and that's a way to tell a story this is another sort of scene setter of the life in the camp and uh, <clears throat> You'll see a few more pigs in some of the other photographs. They used uh, a lot of times a pig as a sacrifice for, uh, they're, they're an animist, they were an animist culture, which means that they uh, believed in the spirits and, and they believed that uh, <clears throat> by sacrificing and by uh, shamanic rituals that they could cure illness and it's another photograph just to show that how different the life is there and and what it'll be different it'll be very different when they get here this is one of the rituals that's a shaman with the hood over her head and there's a sick person next to her, and she's, he had bad stomach pains, and she was gonna cure him. And it, she'd been chanting for two days, I think, at this point. And there's also, you can see the sacrifice of the pig in the background.
This was a funeral of a woman who uh, obviously isn't going to be isn't going to be moving to Milwaukee, but it, I kind of wanted to show that the uh, the family that's all around her is going to have to leave her behind there. They were burying her at the camp, and they're going to be waiting for their plane to the United States. This is, the families would congregate around this board, which, uh, and they were looking for their names to say that would tell them when their flight was and when they would be leaving and where. So they'd come every day and, and look to see where they were, if they were being picked yet to go or not. Okay, so this is kind of, in terms of telling the, pic, the photo story, this is them looking to leave, and then the next photograph is them arriving in Milwaukee at Mitchell Airport, and the woman was <clears throat> overcome with grief because she had to leave her 15-year-old daughter behind in Thailand, and she didn't know the, the daughter was 15, and her husband uh, had to leave the camp, and they t were going to northern Thailand, they didn't process the immigration papers, so that's kind of contrast with the the woman, the, the older woman who was left behind in the funeral. <clears throat> this is their first day of school for the kids, and uh, they were going to a school that had a fairly large Hmong population, and and. Uh, it has a story cloth, they call them, that are sort of a pictorial map like of their exodus out of China, which is way up on the left hand side, and then uh, kind of their journey through China and uh, crossing the Mekong River and going into Burma, where they spent a lot of time at a, at a different refugee camp. They closed the refugee camp in Burma, and they all they ended up in Thailand at a monastery, <coughs> Buddhist monastery called Wat Thong Krabak. So these are the kids, and these the story cloths were made. A lot of them in the camp, and that was a source of income for the mothers and and the women mainly made them. So that's first day of school, which is traumatic for a lot of kids, but it's really traumatic for somebody coming from a whole different culture and a whole different country. I'm sure it was like that for a lot of the people that left during, they escaped the Holocaust and came to other countries. <clears throat> this was what they were living, this woman was living with her eight children in one room, which was common. This is uh, in when they came to visit th their families that were here. And that's the way they lived in the camp, too. They, were, they just had small spaces, and they all lived together. But they look like they're having fun. <laughs> this was in Milwaukee, too, another shamanic ritual where they're, uh, I, th I thought, thought this was pretty interesting because you have the shaman, I, f I found it really interesting, and, and they're building a little fire in the living room, but all the kids that were in the family that was already Americanized are in the background more interested in a computer program. <laughs> but a lot of the <clears throat> cultural elements still remain, and there's, that's a pig that they slaughtered in the basement for, for the shamanic ritual. This was a picture I took just to 
show how a lot of the, the Hmong who, who have been here for a long time <clears throat> have adapted to, uh, this is a Catholic church, so the, no longer an really animist uh, religion. This kind of brought it full circle from the first photograph of the little baby laying on the American flag pillow to this, this kid who's, he, was one, he just got to the country and he's playing a, it's actually a pillow too, it's an electric guitar pillow, but it's American flag. He was doing a Jimi Hendrix or something. <laughs> so that's the last photograph in the story. I took thousands of pictures throughout the whole process, but I think it's important to, um, to make each photograph you know, speak for itself, and I don't really want to repeat things, especially working for a newspaper or something, or a magazine where space is limited. And, and so I think the kids, when you keep doing your documentary project, just keep in mind the import, you should even write down maybe the things that you feel are important in your community and then uh, and go about trying to document those. So that's about all I have. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> All right. Thank you. And Gary and Hannah aren't going to go too far, because in a minute we're going to close up with a general q and I know you probably are sitting on a lot of questions. Um, so why did we do this program? And why did we do these two uh, speakers together? Uh, as you heard during uh, Gary's presentation, we are hoping that you can help us create a documentation, a collection of photographs that tell the story of our Milwaukee Jewish community uh, and our community at large here in Milwaukee. Uh, ours probably won't have as many rituals with pigs uh, in the photos, but but the the idea and I, I I I you know I grew up Jewish here in Milwaukee and and. I could see parallels with some of the own rituals that I grew up with, even within uh, the Hmong community photos. Uh, so that was really beautiful to see. And, and I want us to all be thinking about what are the rituals that, that, you know, that bring us together as, as Jews, as Milwaukeeans? Uh, what are the life cycle events that we celebrate? Who, who is there from, from that baby to the 100-year-old to the, the woman? What makes this community? Uh, we started this project uh, the week before Thanksgiving. It was actually quite intentional. We know that you're going to be out there. You're going to be interacting with your family and your friends over the next few weeks. We're going to have Hanukkah soon. Uh, and then, of course, we have rituals like Shabbat that happen every week. So what pictures can you be taking, however you take them, whether that's on a digital camera, it's on a photo, whether you post it to Instagram or TikTok or just keep it in an album? What photos can we as a community be collecting? Because part two of this program, in March, we're gonna come together again. Uh, we haven't decided if we're gonna do that virtually or in person yet, so stay tuned. But we're gonna come together again. We're going to actually involve uh, stories of a few Holocaust survivors in our community who are gonna show you their photos that they took with them uh, and the photos that they've added to their family story since, since coming here to Milwaukee. And we're gonna ask all of you to bring your photos too and we're gonna find a way to bring our photos together as one. So that is your homework. That's what we want you to start thinking about, and you will be getting some uh, communications from our staff in the next few weeks that will have uh, materials to help you start on that journey. And if you do not have a phone or camera, let us know, because we are also able to help you there and provide you with a camera. So, thank you all for coming. I want to invite Hannah and Gary up here one last time, first so that we can applaud them, and also so that they can answer any questions you have. Uh, we'll end with, with your questions. Thank you. Yeah, sure. 
All right, if you have a question, audience, uh, Michael has a, a microphone so that we can hear you better. Uh, I see Sarah's pointing us this way. Brian, Brian. Brian, Brian has one too, okay. Anybody, questions? You have these two <laughs> award winners right here. How often does that happen? I see a quest few questions up front here. Yeah, thank you. Gonna run away. Um, how long did it take to write the book? Great question. Um, I, start, I first read Yaffa's obituary in 2016. Um, it takes, I did like a few years of research and now it came out last month in 2022. So a book is a journey. It takes a long time sometimes with a lot of writing and rewriting also. Good question. Um, so um, did the person who like did the pictures, did you do it digitally or did she draw them? Uh, also a great <laughs> question. Um, I think it was a combination. Um, she did some uh, painting, some collage, um, some digital, so uh, some watercolor in there, and so also a great question. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot of different media combined. <laughs> um, did you have a like big conversation with Yaffa while you were writing the book? Oh, nice question. I wish I had met Yaffa. Unfortunately, I, l I learned about her after she had passed away, but I feel like I've known her because I interviewed her family members and so many people that I've met. Even yesterday, I met one of the board members of HERC who had met Yaffa when the um, museum, the Holocaust Museum was being built. So I feel like I've come to know her and I wish I knew her. Um, and it's a huge honor to keep her memory alive. But I wish I had known her. My own mother heard her speak, but I never did. Um, it's not really a question, but my um, grandma Ruth and my grandpa Al, they're my great grandma and grandpa, um, they went from Israel to America. It was before the Holocaust, but I've heard a lot of stories about them, and I think it's really inspiring. Oh, thank you for sharing that. I also had family that came from Israel to America. <laughs> I actually have a question for Gary. Um, I'm over here. Hi. <laughs> Um, so my learners have been putting together um, Jewish life through photography portfolios, and um, this is my second year doing it. And my question is, in teaching young photographers, um, you know, how to identify what they want to take a picture of to tell their story, is it more important first to focus on subject versus technique or technique versus subject first? Well, they kind of go together. <clears throat> I mean, I think in order to to be a good photographer, you have to know, you have to learn the technique and make it pretty much uh, so that you don't have to think about what you're doing when you're taking the photograph, except for just what the, what you're photographing. So, <clears throat> it's, yeah, it's kind of like what come, comes first. But you know, you have to have the motivation and the passion for it. Too. So I'd say that that's probably, you know, the, the motivation is first, and then, but you, that'll that'll t you know propel you to learn the techniques. So. so start maybe with like an inspirational subject first, get that moving, and then move into the more technical aspect. Yeah, I think so. It it really helps too. To uh, I know when I was learning, I I just devoured every book on photography that I could and I would sometimes sit and I'd, I'd, I'd know that you know for this photo to be in a in a book it has to be good but sometimes it wasn't obvious at first so I'd look at the photograph and sometimes I'd just stare at it for an hour until finally I'd say oh yeah yeah that's coming together now I see it you know but so it's a lot of it's self-teaching I think does, does one picture you've taken stand out, um, like, from the rest? Excuse me? <laughs> does one picture you've taken, like, out of all the pictures, like, stand out? Um, <clears throat> I think these, the ones that turned out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I usually take a lot of photographs and keep, keep photographing. Sometimes... I'll photograph until I 
feel like I, I can't do anything that's different. And then a lot of times, all of a sudden, you get this aha situation, and, and it'll come to you that the next, the next thing to photograph. So. Um, I have a question for Gary. Um, I was, uh, how long from taking the picture of the baby to taking the picture of everyone in America, how long was that journey? How long was, how long was the journey from the baby picture <clears throat> to America? Um, it was, well, I was there in Thailand for about two weeks, and then the, while I was there, there were families that were already starting to learn when they'd be leaving and coming to Milwaukee. So I'd say it was probably that, that family that you saw that came in, and it was at the, the airport. Uh, it was getting to be cold, and I think, um, so it was, I'm trying to think of when I was actually there. I was there in the fall and yeah, in October, and it was, uh, you know, it was getting to be cold. So it was probably November, like this, kind of. So yeah, kind of a culture, sh not, a, not just a culture shock, but uh, they, were, they weren't used to snow or cold. Or... Um, how did you find out so much information about Yaffa? Was it like all from her children, or did you find out through other ways? Um, so I read Yaffa's book about herself, but there's also, you can go on YouTube and see, um, there's a documentary that is narrated by Ed Asner, the actor, whose father, I believe, was from Aisha Shock. Um, there are many newspaper articles and magazine articles about Yaffa. She was pretty well known. Um, and there are many interviews with her. So you can listen to her own words, talk about her own exhibit. So um, there are many ways of learning about her. Um, for both of you, what was your most memorable part of your journeys? Most memorable, most memorable. part of the journey. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, well, for my, my journey was quite a long, long one, about 40 years in photography, and uh, most memorable, I'd have to say, well, there were a couple of them. The first big story I did, I was, did a story on child mortality and went to Asia, to India, Nepal, and Bangladesh. So. It, I really wanted to, I've always wanted to uh, bring social issues to light and through photography and to the public that way. So that was the first chance I really had, I think, to, to really sink my teeth into a documentary story. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how to answer, but what, the first thing that came to mind is that when um, I was in Israel visiting my parents uh, when I got word from Scholastic that they were going to publish the story. And I read the story just in manuscript form to my father, and I couldn't get through it without bawling. I was crying my eyes out. And it wasn't because I had a book deal. <laughs> it was because I was going to be able to share Yaffa's story with children like you guys. And my dad said, it's OK to cry. Some things are worth crying for. <laughs> This question is for Gary, and since you have been a photographer for over 40 years and you've gone through film to digital, mm. my question is what is the best way to catalog all of those um, pictures? I have boxes and boxes from <laughs> my parents, my grandparents, and I have my phone and I have a digital camera. How does one do that? And how do you do that? Well, my wife, doesn't really like it that I don't do it because <laughs> I have closets full of boxes of, of old negatives and photographs too. And um, <clears throat> I know, you know, I, I'm, I've heard that the even the historical society doesn't won't take, you know, archives of photographs anymore because they're just loaded down with so many things. I keep wanting to take my prints and the black and whites and that old stuff and, 
and digitize it so that I, I can store it easier. Um, but so far, I haven't done very much of that. Sorry. <laughs> What makes you like next decide what you're gonna write about or photograph? Like, is it just something you saw on a trip? Is it something you've been thinking about for a while? What makes you decide to start your next journey? Um, I hope I understood your question right. I, whenever I go, when I ever did a big story, a big documentary project, sometimes it would last for a year or so over time. But usually beforehand, I always kind of picture in my mind what, what I c could photograph or what the possibilities are. And it never turns out to be the way that you think it is. But the more you concentrate on, on what you're doing and, and try to think what's, what it would be good, you know, things will come to you. And you'll have these aha moments where all of a sudden you know that that's that's the time, that's the photo, you know. That, and it, I used to, sometimes when it, that would happen, I could hardly take the photograph because I got so excited. And, and, but you just have to, have to keep doing it. Yeah, for me, I know you're going to spend a lot of time researching and writing. I write both fiction and nonfiction. So it has to be something I'm really excited and passionate about because you're going to end up spending years on the project. Um, so write what you love, write from your heart. Um, I want to thank both of you for sharing so much of your journey with us. I think it's amazing. Um, one of the, the things that I've been thinking about is how it was difficult, for instance, for Yafa to even get some of those mementos that she was going for, even though she was within the Jewish community. And so, in fact, I think the question is for Gary, because you are inserting yourself into different cultures um, that have different identities, different uh, priorities, different perspectives. And as a United States white male coming into different environments, especially today, I was wondering if you could share some of your thoughts about how you think about going in and, and somewhat objectifying people by taking photographs of them but it seems like they're very responsive to you and that you've really developed a connection with them. But I, I do know that photography is a, also a way of object, objectifying. Um, so if you could speak to that, that would be great. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I, have, I guess I've always tried to develop a rapport with the people that I'm photographing. Um, and really try to take sort of the fly on the wall sort of approach to, and, and <clears throat> I know I've, you know, sometimes I've taken photographs that I really like and, and that have run in the newspaper and all of a sudden people will you know, get a complaint, you know, you get complaints from readers and, and uh, because I don't know. I remember one photograph I took. I was doing a story on, uh, I think it was on poverty, and there was a woman who had three children, I think, and she was raising them on her own, and she was struggling. And I photographed, because she got up at like four in the morning in order to get her kids off to school, and she had to take a bus ride to her work, which was the other side of town, and it took over an hour on the bus. So I, I got up one morning, went there, and she was on the couch, it was like at four in the morning, and she was laying there uh, smoking a cigarette, and I took the photograph. It was a real photograph, but I, I did hear some complaints about that because it, the like you said, kind of objectifying, you know, or she was a lot more than, than that, I guess. But. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, both of you have a question for Hannah. Um, 
my family came from a small shuttle Schmelnik, and I was fortunate to go visit it. And what they've done over there, they rebuilt the synagogue. I'm kind of curious what you know, I can't pronounce the village or the shuttle that Hoffa was at, but do you know what has happened since yeah. the war? Yeah, I mean, I, that's a great question. I, I have not been to Poland. It's now Lithuania. Um, but I have heard there aren't any Jews in Aishashak. And the Jewish kidlit world is pretty small. Um, the children's literature um, world is very small. Um, and because I mentioned early on that I was writing a book about Yaffa Eliyah from Aisha Shock, another author reached out to me and said, I've been there, <laughs> and we Zoomed together. And she went back, she had gone on a heritage trip to, I think it was like Hungary and Lithuania, and her tour, she wasn't going to Aisha Shock, she was going to a nearby shtetl, and her tour guide said, oh, there's another shtetl near here we should see, it's called, you know, former shtetl, called Aisha Shock. And she discovered that she had family from there. And if you look in Yaffa's book, her, name, her family name was Farber, and they're in Yaffa's book. <laughs> so um, there aren't Jews there today. There are no synagogues. The synagogue was actually the center of Jewish life there. Yaffa goes through like all the holidays and celebrations. And it was a paradigm of other shtetls. Um, but Jewish life did not return to Aishashak. What there is is a marker in the field where the Jews were murdered. That's what's left there. If you could go back in time and ask one question to Yaffa, what would you ask? Oh, boy. <laughs> <coughs> wow, what a question. <laughs> Give me a moment. <laughs> Can I ask you what question you would ask her while I'm thinking? <laughs> I would probably ask her what it was like to have to run away and leave all and leave the town behind. Beautiful. Yeah, and I would ask like where she got her strength from. She went through so much and she could have been enveloped in darkness, but she had hope and resilience. She was really strong. So, thank you for asking that question. Excellent question. <laughs> Can I ask you all a question? <laughs> when I asked you, like, if you see your community in the book, did anyone think of anything that connected you from Milwaukee with Aisha Shock? Anything seemed familiar? And any of, I don't know if you have a book in front of you, you can maybe look through it. I was thinking maybe Shabbat candles or intergenerational scenes like you have today. <laughs> Yeah. It was like the family reunion where they were all in the graveyard um, telling stories. It's kind of reminded me of my family's Passover, where we all like gather around a table and like share stories about like our great grandmothers and grandfathers and like their um, history <coughs> through um, Europe. So I just kind of connected through that. Yeah, beautiful. Um, she said the scene at the beginning where they collect, they got together at the graveyard, and I, someone pointed out to me, sometimes people who read your story tell you more about it than you actually know, and they said that was foreshadowing because here the elders were telling the younger generation, then Yaffa's mother told her, and then she shared her story with all of us. What really... Turn it on? Okay, there. Um, what really resonates with me, not being of your faith, was or were the pages where the children were playing in the snow, ice skating, running in the woods. This is universal, yes. you know, and I right. think that that really ties it in. It's not just, you know, right. segregated like that. Everybody has that childhood kind of thing. And we would all feel really devastated, you know, being removed from that world that we know. Right. Thank you. Like, we're all people. That's what we want people to see. And most people who go to visit the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum are not Jewish, and yet they see themselves in the photographs, and that's exactly what Yaffa would want. Okay, thank you.
Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you to our wonderful speakers, our staff, our board who helped make this program possible. Uh, I again want to thank Wisconsin Humanities and the Rickheimer families for sponsoring today's program. Uh, Hannah will be available outside the doors to sign books, uh, so please go ahead and do that. And if you do not have a copy of the book yet, uh, you, they are available for purchase by Boswell Books over here. Uh, th happy Thanksgiving, everybody, and, and thank you so much for coming.